Okay, so welcome YouTube. For those of you familiar with this channel, you'll know that we've hosted some discussions uh, between mainstream ideas in science and their challenges. So we hosted a discussion between Alan Guth and Sir Roger Penrose on inflationary cosmology versus a cyclic universe, and David Gross and Carla Ravelli on string theory versus loop quantum gravity. Today, we've got an equally exciting topic, and that's dark matter versus modified gravity. Now, the vast majority of cosmologists accept that most of the matter in the universe uh, is not described by standard physics. It's dark matter, or maybe we should say it's invisible matter as we cannot see it, but we infer its existence from its gravitational effects. So that, of course, raises a question, well, maybe our theories of gravity need modifying. And some cosmologists have explored these modified gravity theories that may um, reduce or even eliminate the need for dark matter. So to help us understand these issues, I'm really excited to introduce our panel. We've got some of the world's leading experts. Firstly, Simon White. Simon is the uh, Emeritus Director of the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. He's probably best known for his work on the computer simulation of large-scale structures in the universe. And that's been extremely influential in establishing dark matter as a leading paradigm in physics. So welcome, Simon. Thank you. Nice to and be here. we also have Stacey McGar, Professor of Astronomy at Case Western University. He specializes in the study of low surface brightness galaxies. He's authored a review of the uh, modified gravity paradigm in Living Reviews of Relativity, and is probably, I think, the most eloquent defender of, of this idea. So welcome, Stacey. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so before we get into the sort of meat of the conversation, why don't we just get to know our guests? Simon, why don't you tell us, how, how did you get involved in, in physics and astro astrophysics in particular? Uh, astrophysics in particular was an accident. Uh, at school, I, I enjoyed physics, and mathematics, but also languages and music, uh, but decided to do mathematics at university. <clears throat> so I went to Cambridge and discovered when I was in Cambridge that although I'm pretty good at mathematics, there are a lot of people out there who are a whole lot better at it than I was. <clears throat> in any case, I discovered I was more interested in <clears throat> what British people call applied mathematics, which is to say uses of mathematics to describe phenomena in, in the physical world. And so I moved gradually towards theoretical physics and uh, applications of mathematics there. And then when it came to, to thinking about doing research, I looked around in Cambridge for places to do research, and I was particularly interested in fluid dynamics and, and how, how um, plasmas and, and fluids work in the universe. And the two places to do this were in applied mathematics, which was in the basement of a, of a rather dingy building in the middle of town. And then there was astrophysics, which was in a very nice airy building surrounded by daffodils on the outside of town. So I decided that actually astrophysics looked like a better deal. Is that and the then, Hoyle Center? The Hoyle Center, that's yes, right. It was set up there by Fred Hoyle. And the first thing Fred did was, A, design the building to make, make it pleasant for the people sitting there, and secondly, to plant daffodils all around it so that it was very nice in the spring. Right. So I went there, and actually before I went there, I, I had a girlfriend at the time in the U.S. I wanted to find something to do to be a bit close to her, actually, she was quite close to where Stacy is now. And, uh, and the closest I could find to, to I could get a, a one year course doing astrophysics was actually in Toronto. So I went to Toronto for a year and learned observational astronomy. So by the time I got back to Cambridge, I actually knew some astronomy as well as just some uh, theoretical physics. So that's how I got into it. And what about you, Stacy? Uh, well, I, I was an annoyingly precocious child who was interested in everything about how the world worked. And, you know, um, I think my parents got tired of answering questions, so they just started handing me science books, which I devoured. And um, I really um, sort of had a tendency to what Simon might describe as fundamentalist physics. Um, I really wanted to know how things worked. And, and there's both a a scientific aspect to that and an almost religious aspect to that. And those things kind of overlap in the brain. Um, and I also got into astrophysics sort of accidentally in that uh, I was a physics major in college. I went to MIT and I also had to do a senior thesis. So I was casting about for uh, what to do. Uh, 
and my uh, advisor, who was a laser physicist, suggested I should work to George Cl with George uh, Whipple Clark because he was a great guy, um, and um, he uh, he was an X-ray astronomer. But um, they, they he was doing this project on um, isophotal twists in uh, elliptical galaxies, looking to see if there was evidence for triaxial structure in these stellar blobs. And um, he took me observing, and um, I really loved it. Um, and I wasn't quite captured at that point. I did go to a, a physics program for the first year. I was at um, Princeton, and I worked in a laser lab. And it's much like um, um, Simon described. You can work in this closed, darkened room where you have to worry about putting your eye out, uh, or you can be on top of a mountain in a beautiful setting where you can actually see the stars. And so. Uh, I switched uh, to the University of Michigan, which I went to uh, in part because I knew I could get a lot of telescope time there, uh, and in part because it was sort of the the best place that uh, my spouse and I could agree to go. Um, so <laughs> the trying to the solve the two body is, problem. Yes, exactly, and that that's uh, that's why I'm where I am now. Um, it's uh, it's a defining uh, issue for many academics. Right, right. Okay, so Simon, why don't we start? going into dark matter, like, can you lay out what were the main discoveries in, in the 20th century that have led cosmologists to conclude that um, you know, we live in a universe dominated by, at least on the matter side, by dark matter? But actually, I think in terms of direct observational evidence, it began quite early, very soon after it was discovered that the universe is actually significantly bigger than just our own Milky Way, because very soon after Hubble discovered that the Andromeda Nebula was well outside our own Milky Way, then he and his collaborators discovered the expansion of the universe. They found out the further galaxies are away, the further they, they appear to be receding from us. And you see the Doppler effect in their spectra as a redshift. So the expansion of the universe was already discovered in the 19, uh, 1920s. Um, by the early 1930s, redshifts had been measured for a sufficient number of galaxies that people could see that although this tendency for things further away to be moving faster was pretty, pretty uniform, there were exceptions. And in particular, there were galaxies that seemed to be at the same place, which had different velocities. And this was very soon interpreted as being just that. And in fact, the, these were galaxies which are at the same place in the universe but were moving with different speeds relative to each other, even though they were close together. And so the question was, what was causing those motions? And this was already becoming clear in the early 1930s. And the first person who really pointed this out forcefully was a Swiss astronomer called Fritz Zwicky. And he looked at the nearby, a biggest nearby cluster of galaxies, the Coma Cluster, and found about half a dozen. In fact, I think in the end, he had about 10 galaxies in the coma cluster, which he was able to measure velocities for. And although they all seemed to be in the same place, he found they were moving at velocities more than a thousand kilometers a second relative to each other. So he then estimated how much mass they would have to be if, if, if the, they would have to have associated with them if this relative motion was due to the gravitational attraction in the way that the Earth's motion around the sun, our 30 kilometers a second motion around the sun, is due to the sun's gravity acting on the Earth. So you can do a similar calculation for the galaxies in the cluster and ask how much mass would they have to have in order to produce velocities of the size that you see. And he came out with a number which was several hundred times larger than what he thought the mass of all the stars was. So that was the first surfacing of this particular problem. And actually, that's stayed for a very long time, the main source of it. And it was looked on by most astronomers just as a curiosity. And it stayed that way by the 1960s, say, there are now measurements of quite a few nearby clusters of galaxies with quite a few galaxies in them. And this was, phenomenon was, was general. And so people knew that there was some kind of discrepancy in the way galaxies were moving inside clusters. And then what happened to join this was starting in 1957, actually, right after the war, when radio astronomy first started uh, started up. It started up actually in the UK and the Netherlands first because they changed their radar telescopes and made radio telescopes. And one of the first 
telescopes that came up in Holland was in a place called Dwingeloo. And the first thing they, they looked at when they switched the telescope on in the 1956, I think it was, was the Andromeda Nebula M M31. And they measured the rotation curve. And they found immediately the result, which then stood up ever since, that the, the stars in the body of the galaxy seem to be on roughly circular orbits. Actually, they were measuring the, the hydrogen gas, not the stars. But they found the hydrogen gas was going around the center of the galaxy and what could be modeled as circular orbits, like planets going around in the solar system, but that they were going around at roughly 200 kilometers a second, and this didn't change with radius. Whereas in the solar system, the velocities of, of, of the planets go down as you get further from the center. This didn't happen for the gas in M31. It stayed at roughly the same speed, dropped a little bit, but not very much. And so those measurements for 1957 held up all the way through the 1960s and the 1970s. And by the end of 1970s, the radio telescopes have made similar maps for quite a few other galaxies, and they found this behavior was general. And so this appeared as though, as you went out, even though you, the gas extended out beyond any of the stars, you still get kept getting more mass, at least if you thought you, the same laws applied as doing the solar system, because... Of course, in the solar system, the sun's mass is what it is. And so as you go further away, the planets go slower. But as you went further away in the galaxies, they don't go slower. They go about the same speed. And so that either needs a different law of gravity, which is what Stacy will tell you about, or, or, or it needs more mass. And so this started to seem like maybe there's more mass around the galaxies than, than you can see in the stars. And so this was the second avenue. And then since then, other avenues have come up. The main, main ones which I think are important for our discussion probably is the effect of gravity on light. And so when light rays go past, for example, uh, Ed Eddington uh, verified Einstein's theory of, of, of general relativity, his theory of gravity, by showing that when the light of a star passes slightly close to the sun, the light rays path is bent by the gravity of the sun by an amount which is predicted correctly by Einstein and incorrectly by the modification of Newton's laws. And the same effect occurs when light from very distant galaxies goes past nearer galaxies. The light rays get bent and the effect can actually be measured. This is called gravitational lensing. And so you can use gravitational lensing of background objects by things which are in front of them to measure the amount of mass associated with the foreground objects. And this is another way you can measure how much mass is surrounding an object without actually being able to see that mass directly. And nowadays, that's become a really a powerful probe, and, and you can use it on galaxy clusters or on the extended regions around galaxies. And again, you find more mass than you can account for by the things you see directly. And then the final place where it's important is in the, in the universe as a whole, where it appears that the amount of material we see in the form of what we call baryons, which is to say ordinary protons, neutrons, and electrons, ordinary hydrogen, effectively, is not enough to cause the structure of objects to grow in the universe. And this is measured most directly, actually, in the early universe, when you look at the microwave background radiation, the relic radiation from the Big Bang. What we see when we look at that is the universe as it was when the universe was 400,000 years old. So actually very, very early compared to today. And at that time it was very nearly uniform. So the first thing that was discovered with the microwave background back in the 1960s was that it's nearly uniform in the sky. And it took 30 years to actually find any deviation from uniformity. But nowadays those de deviations from uniformity, which are called fluctuations in the microwave background, we measure very, very precisely and what we think we're seeing in those are fluctuations in, in what effectively are cosmic clouds back when the universe was only 400,000 years old and was very nearly uniform. And because those are essentially sound waves propagating in the cosmic clouds, we can analyze their properties very precisely. And we have very precise measurements. So what you can find is that the clouds at that time cannot be just made of gas. There has to be another component there as well, which adds gravity, but doesn't interact directly with the light. So there's also you then dark matter is apparently needed to explain the, the properties of microwave background fluctuations. So I think those are sort of the main current sources
of apparent information about what we think might be the problems of the dark matter. And I think, I mean, Stacy obviously can comment on this, but I think I think the phenomenology is basically well established, and people don't agree uh, disagree with it at the level at which I've been telling you about it. The issue is how you interpret it, whether it's actually due to dark matter or due to something else. But the you. Uh, an alternative explanation will need to explain all these different things. It's no good focusing on just one part of it. Right. right. And just before I come on to Stacey, can you just explain your involvement? Because you were part of this thing called the Gang of Four. And that, in my history books, that's considered very influential. What was yeah, that was one of the more flattering things we were called at the time, actually. <laughs> I mean, you know, it had to, we were a group of four co-authors all about the same age who worked on this problem in the early days. So the Gang of Four was better, at least, than the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which was another of the names for the group. But uh, so what it was realized fairly early on that if this idea, and this was actually before any of the evidence from gravitational lensing on the microwave background that I've talked about, was this was in the end of the 1970s, the beginning of the 90s, it was actually before that observational evidence was was accumulated. So... At that point, the main evidence was coming from the galaxy clusters, uh, from the apparent presence of halos around individual galaxies, and from a few uh, other measurements in the nearby universe. So the idea that this could be due to some new kind of matter which had been present there since the Big Bang and had gravity, but no other interactions with ordinary matter, was put forward in the late 1970s, and it was realized <clears throat> fairly early on that if, if this was really true, then it could the model, uh, the simplest versions of this would actually predict what the initial conditions should look like. And so that gave actually a well-defined initial condition for how the universe would have evolved. And so it tells you that at early times, it would be very simple with just the modified gravitationally modified sound waves of the, of the kind they discussed. And that later, as things became the amplitude of all these fluctuations became bigger and bigger. Eventually, it'd separate from the rest of the expansion, collapse, and turn into stars and galaxies and things we see. So the idea is you have a rather simple initial condition whose properties you can predict theoretically, and then it would have to turn into what we see in the present-day universe because of all the later evolution. And so that was a, from a, a computationally attractive thing because you have an initial condition, which you know well, and you just ask if you've given that initial condition, will it turn to what I see around us? So it invites you to start with a, a, a computer model for and, and just follow it and see if it really produces in the present day universe things that uh, look like what we see. And so the, the first suggestion for the dark matter was actually that it should be massive neutrinos. And actually we know now that neutrinos do have mass. In fact, it's the only kind of dark matter that we know is a an elementary particle, but it's only a few percent of what's needed to solve the issues that we're, we've been, we'll be discussing. So there is elementary particle dark matter, but the ones that we know of, it's not enough. Right. But back in the 1970s, it thought it seemed as though that could be enough. And so well, the first thing we tried was to run simulations, which started assuming the dark matter was neutrinos. And what we found was that the structure which it, this model produces, it's called nowadays it's called the hot dark matter model, <clears throat> doesn't match the present day universe. And the reason is because the, you know, the at early times, the, in, the neutrinos have some interactions with the rest of the matter. They're not strong, but they still have some. And so that means the particles are actually heated up by their interactions with the other matter at early times in the Big Bang. And the motions coming from that wash out all the structure in the neutrinos at later times. And as a result, only very big structures are left over to make galaxies and galaxy clusters. <clears throat> and when we followed this in detail, it turned out it couldn't match the observations of, of real galaxy distributions. <clears throat> that's, that's what well, the first thing we did was to, was to rule out this hot dark matter. And then the question, well, if it's not neutrinos, there weren't you know, any other known particles. So you just have to invite your particle physics friends to invent some new kind of dark matter. And they're obliged with lots and lots of suggestions. And then we found that some of those suggestions, particularly ones where you didn't have these rapid motions at early times, could produce structures which look really quite similar to what's seen. And so those 
then seem like a success. So, you know, at, at the cost of, uh, of hypothesizing something which is entirely outside the known laws of physics at the time, um, still outside the known laws of physics, I think, actually, but at least, you know, within somebody's idea of what might be the laws of physics, um, then we could get a relatively good match. So that's what the Gang of Four did, was set up this program to simulate first the neutrinos and then the cold dark matter and show that cold dark matter did seem to look like the real galaxy distribution. Okay. All right, so Stacey, let, let's come on to you. Um, first off, before we go into modified gravity, uh, we, would it be right to say that we're basically all in agreement about the, obs the observations in the sense of we agree there are flat rotation curves and the movements of clusters is too rapid to account for. So these are the sorts of things, things that Simon laid out. We are in rough agreement about those. Is that, is that right? Yes, uh, completely. I mean, uh, I agree with everything Simon just said, and it's, it's more a matter of how you interpret the data than, uh, than what the data actually say. Um, right. So, yeah. so let's go into then, what is modified gravity? And what's the difference between modified gravity and MOND? And, and uh, how did you end up becoming uh, into, into this camp? So uh, basically, you've already laid it out that we have these discrepancies, as Simon described, that when you apply the laws of gravity that were taught to us by Newton and Einstein to uh, extragalactic objects like galaxies and clusters of galaxies and the universe as a whole, uh, it doesn't work. That is, what you see does not predict what you get for motions. Um, and so I was convinced, um, like Simon and like most everybody else, that this meant there had to be some uh, additional form of uh, mass, almost certainly uh, a dark matter particle, and, and at the time, uh, most likely a WIMP, um, uh, the, one of these weakly interacting massive particles, and the, the piece of evidence that was most persuasive to me was was on the one hand structure formation, and that was an important thing, but the other really important thing to me was a Big Bang nucleosynthesis, uh, that we really understand how uh, the light elements came to be in their isotopes uh, during the, the nuclear furnace of the first few minutes of the Big Bang. Uh, and we can go out uh, as astronomers and measure those abundances and, and give uh, a, a constraint on what the density of normal matter has to be. Uh, and then you, you look at these other uh, uh, kinds of evidence, you, you try to work out the, the mass of uh, the gravitating mass of a cluster of galaxies, and it's much larger than what can be explained by just the stuff you see. Uh, and you can combine this, as, as you know, Simon was a leader in doing, with, with the, the mass density uh, uh, that you knew you had to have for normal matter in order to get these light element abundances right. Uh, and that implied there had to be a lot more mass out there. Um, there was something gravitating that was not normal matter. That is, the total mass density was clearly bigger than um, what we what we could have in normal matter. So there's something out there um, that that is a apparently a new particle. And, and as Simon says, the, the particle physicists have been all too happy to suggest uh, possibilities for that. Um, so that's sort of the the starting point I came from very much the same place as where Simon described. Um, and it was a very hard realization for me that there could be an ambiguity. So um, what happened in my own experience um, was that I was working on my data for low surface brightness galaxies. Uh, then as a young postdoc, both Simon and I were at Cambridge at the time. Um, and I had my own ideas for how these galaxies formed, and, and in a nutshell, I thought they were uh, late. For, they, they formed in late forming halos. So, um, dark matter halos form with some mass spectrum, which Simon's an expert about. Um, and at a given mass, uh, some formed a little early, some form a little late. There's some distribution, uh, and everything I had learned about low surface brightness galaxies up to that time led me to suspect that they were in the late forming tail of that distribution. Um, and that made a couple of predictions. One was that they should be less strongly clustered than um, brighter galaxies. Um, and my office, I, I didn't know how to test that 
uh, but my office mate at the time, Ho Jun Mo, who, who's written a whole book on the subject with Simon, um, did. And so we went out and made that test and it, it came true. So, yay, uh, you know, my theory is right. Um, the other prediction that it made, though, was that there should be a shift off of the Tolly fisher relation. The Tolly fisher relation is a relation between how massive a galaxy is and how fast it spins, that flat rotation speed. Um, and if you actually construct a mass model, then you have these multiple components. There's what you see in the stars and the gas, and there's what you don't see in the dark matter. And at the radii, we were measuring these rotation curves. All of those things matter. Um, and what um, I predicted was that these things should shift off of Tolly fisher relations, basically because the luminous matter that we can see is more spread out. That's what makes them low surface brightness. Uh, the velocity that you measure depends on the ratio of mass to radius. So same mass, bigger radius, that contribution to the velocity goes down. And if the dark matter is more or less the same, then the total velocity goes down just because you've yanked out that luminous component. So I predicted a shift. Uh, went to um, the Netherlands, where they do all this radio astronomy and collaborated with some folks there, and we found that there was no shift whatsoever. Um, so, you know, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> um, so, so the first key to that was disproving my own idea, and that was a really hard thing to accept. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, well, I didn't get it right. Maybe somebody else did. And I started looking around and I, I didn't really find a satisfactory um, prediction for this uh, behavior. Um, and I tried building a lot of other kinds of models myself. Uh, and I spent months pounding my head against the wall and they, they all ended up being sort of teleological. That is, every time I thought I had succeeded, it was because I had built something into the assumptions that made it come out the way I wanted to do. Um, so I was really baffled at this juncture. Um, and just, uh, this is a chance meeting in Middle Earth, uh, a coincidence I sometimes wish never happened, but um, Marty Milgram came through and gave a talk at the time. Milgram is the one who um, uh, devised these modified Newtonian dynamics. And I remember looking at the ad and, uh, for his talk and thinking, you oh, know, modified gravity, who wants to listen to that nonsense? I'm, I'm not going to go. Um, but I did go. And in a few lines, he basically derived everything that was confusing me and said, OK, if <coughs> instead of dark matter, um, we're seeing these discrepancies because gravity is wrong and specifically the force law looks like you know, he could write down the, the formula, uh, which is basically just an amplification of Newton's uh, formula at low accelerations. But if you do that, then it predicted um, what I was seeing for the tolly fisher relation because the dependence on radius drops out and you predict zero shift. Um, so I got interested and went back to my office and I had other projects going, so I forgot about it for about six months. And then uh, I came back to it and said, well, I should read his papers. We never do that, right? Actually read papers. And I, I went back and read his original series of papers and um, 1983B, the second in the three uh, series of three papers in which he introduced the idea, uh, it had a very specific section saying, low surface brightness galaxies will be a strong test uh, because the low surface density means they should be low acceleration, so they should be far in a modified regime, and here's what they should do. And I remember, again, thinking, because I had time to get over the initial being impressed by, by him getting this right, and reverted to my, my normal ways of thinking, which was dark matter. And so when I read that, I'm like, great, I have the data that will falsify this stupid theory. That, that's literally how I thought about it. Um, but then I went down the list and he just made this list of a half a dozen points and all I could do was check, 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 check. Yeah, I mean, he basically nailed everything I was seeing. So what am I supposed to say? That, that he's wrong? <laughs> um, and I struggled with that. So this, this com sort of completes the, the other part of your question in that I spent many sleepless nights staring at the ceiling like, how can this stupid theory get any predictions right? when there's so much evidence for dark matter.
because as Simon says, there are a lot of things you have to understand besides just rotation curves. Um, and it finally dawned on me that I was thinking about it in a too narrow way that we call the problem the dark matter problem. And by giving it that name, we kind of predispose the answer. But really all we know is that there's a discrepancy and either there's dark matter or the inference of dark matter is caused by assuming equations which don't apply. And there's some other equation. And so in a nutshell, that's what the modified dynamics are. They're, they're saying there's some other force law. Uh, and every time we infer dark matter is because of that force law. Now, it's another thing to go out and test uh, whether that's true and everything. And I've, I've certainly tried to do that. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it does not. Um, right. So that's uh, that sort of <laughs> gets us to where we are today. Right. OK, so Simon, let me come on to you and we'll, we'll come back on to other issues, you know, bullet clusters and so on and so forth. But let's just talk about this Tully Fisher relationship. Um, is there a way to explain that within the dark matter paradigm? Why? Presumably you've looked at this data. Why are you not convinced that this is evidence for modified gravity? Well, it's because, I mean, I don't disagree with anything Stacy said, let's be, be clear. And, and um, but galaxies are complicated objects. And if you look at galaxies, which are the same in some ways, like they have the same, same number of stars, for example, or the same characteristic velocity, you, they actually find they look, they can look pretty different. And so you actually get galaxies which are, you know, in some some global way is similar and in terms of details can look rather different in terms of their structure. So, for example, Stacy has been concentrating on low surface brightness galaxies, but actually you can find high surface brightness galaxies of the same mass where you have basically the same number of stars, but just crammed into a much smaller region. Or you can find galaxies which have large um, amounts of gas or galaxies have very little gas but roughly the same number of stars. Or you can find galaxies where, where the rotation curve is rises rapidly towards a value and then stays flat, or where it rises very low, uh, slowly towards a similar value and then stays flat. So when you look at galaxies, particularly when you look at pictures of, the, of some of the small ones that uh, the, they serve, so they look pretty irregular. And so I'm... I'm not sure the, the, the regular, the, the, what we're seeing. So what Stacy is saying is if you take things very broad brush and you plot up and, and just plot the characteristic values against each other, you seem to very, see a very nice regularity, which he calls the baryonic tully fisher relation, which basically says that if you just assume that the baryonic mass, that's to say the gas and the stars that you can actually see, are all the masses there, and then you take some law like Milgram's law or some other version of it and plot them up, you get a, you get a relation between the char characteristic velocities and the, um, and the total amount of stuff in the galaxies, which is very regular and looks like a simple power law. And you know, this looks good enough that you can say, well, how can this be by chance? There must be something fundamental there. But it's ac actually you're plotting out rather simple properties of the galaxies and they're much more complicated and the, when you look at them individually, they're, they're, they aren't so regular for all the reasons I put up there. So there's also a diversity. So one of the things that has happened in recent years is the ability to do computer simulations, which follow not only what happens to the large scale structure of the universe, but also the formation of the galaxies themselves have grown uh, tremendously in power. So nowadays, people who do these kind of galaxy formation simulations are able to make the, their simulations produce things which plausibly look quite like real galaxies, or at least some of their simulated galaxies look like some real galaxies, I think is the, probably the correct way to put it, where the entire populations agree, I think, uh, almost, if you look over a broad enough range, they never do. And that's because both in the real world and in their simulations, there are many complicated processes which determine how stars form, how black holes form at the middle of galaxies, how those formation processes influence the further evolution of the galaxies. All these, all these processes do change how galaxies look and they change the distribution of the material inside them. So, you know, in, in the simulations, 
how you try to model those processes makes quite a big difference to the outcome. So what's happened in practice is people have played around with it until they get things that look more or less like real galaxies and then they feel happy. So there's a sort of selection effect to ma towards making simulations that look at least okay for the things that people were trying to simulate. Um, it's unclear whether that's a correct representation of what's happening in real galaxies. So the, the situation is the people who do the simulations will say will tell you that they've fitted most galaxies moderately well, including the low surface brightness ones. And people with a more critical attitude, I think rightly, you know, Stacey, I'm sure will be one of these will come back. So sure, you fitted those guys, but look at these over here, you know, they, they, they're, they're nothing like the real world. And that's kind of where we are. It's just a very complicated systems. And so it's not, I disagree with Stacey's argument. I just think that this is a very, the, we're looking at the most complicated regions of the galaxies, the inner regions where all these things interact with each other. And so it's hard to be sure whether you can treat everything that's going on at the level which is necessary to make definite conclusions. Stacey, do you want to come back on that? Do you, how do you feel about that? that well, I, I think all that's true. Um, the trick is, as Simon just described, getting a, a comparison, a prediction, a prior. A theory is only as good as its prior. And so we really want a straight up prediction between the two things. And my experience has been that the, the evidence is really quite incommensurate. I mean, what Mon does well, dark matter models are like, oh, it's complicated and maybe, maybe not. Um, and then what dark matter does really well is large scale cosmology, which Mon doesn't even attempt to address. Um, so it's really hard to, to compare these apples and oranges. Now, I've worked very hard on the, the modeling side of these things, not in the simulations in the way that Simon described, but in actually building models for real galaxies and dark matter models. And I think if it were just Tully Fisher, then yeah, you can come up with um, uh, ideas that will do that. Uh, and in fact, one obvious one uh, that gets away from the problem I described about, you know, yanking out a component uh, of the mass, the luminous mass, is to just imagine that the luminous mass is always subdominant, that the dark matter is basically controlling what's going on. And so it doesn't really matter if it's a high surface brightness or a low surface brightness galaxy because the kinematics are basically all dark matter all the time. And then you would expect at a, a given stellar mass that you have the same dark matter halo mass and you get basically the same Tauli Fisher relation. You can do that. Um, that's only a piece of the puzzle, though. So as, as Simon alluded to, there's also this diversity of rotation curves that at a given mass, the shapes of rotation curves are very different. Um, and that is to say, Tauli Fisher is just talking about that flat part way out. Um, as far as we can measure it. We can also measure the shape of the rotation curve at much smaller radii, and that correlates with the surface brightness of the stars. Um, high surface brightness galaxies have, have rotation curves that rise very ri rapidly. Low surface brightness galaxies have rotation curves that rise very slowly. And it's explaining the combination of things that's difficult. Because uh, if you just uh, say what I did, uh, that, uh, okay, this luminous mass is subdominant, you can explain Tully Fisher, but you cannot explain that the diversity correlates with the luminous matter, um, because you've, you've defined it to be irrelevant. Um, and, and is once that a prediction you... of, of Mont, Stacey? So yeah, yeah. So 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 I was you know, I'm just talking about dark matter models there, right? And and the thing that I always found is that there's a sort of a fine tuning going on, and that was one of the things that really uh, hurt me slash opened my eyes was to realize that basically all the fine tuning problems like this that I was struggling with had been predicted by Mont. So yeah, this this um, dependence on the surface brightness was explicitly predicted by Mon. That was one of the checkboxes that I alluded to was that Milgram had explicitly said that high surface brightness galaxies would have rapidly rising rotation curves that then flattened off and low surface brightness galaxies would have gradually rising ones. And it's explaining those two things simultaneously um, that is challenging in, in dark matter. Uh, but there's a deeper problem than that, that I do think is fundamental because it is correct to say that there's a lot of complicated physics that should go on 
um, in, from the dark matter perspective. And galaxies are very different and complicated objects. And yet, you know, and you have to switch hats, right? I can say that with a dark matter hat and put on a Mond hat and say, yeah, but look, they all follow the predictions of this really simple effective force law. And it is the distribution of the stuff we can see, the normal matter, the stars and the gas, that is predictive of the total kinematics. And so if I didn't put on a, a, a dark matter hat, I'm like, well, maybe I can explain that, but it doesn't make any sense because the, the, the baryons, the normal matter is just sort of the tail of the dog and it's the tail that's wagging the whole dog. Um, and, you know, I can arrange some model where that happens and maybe I can get it right, but why shouldn't I prefer the theory that predicted it in the first place? Simon, why shouldn't we prefer the theory that predicted it rather than this fine-tuned, I can make it fit type scenario? It's because, you know, I think we're, fo we're focusing on the number of hairs on the tail to tell the difference between, between a warthog and a rhinoceros. You know, I think you have to, you should look at where most of the stuff is. And by focusing on, on the centers of galaxies, we're looking at the most complicated place. So... <laughs> You know, this is most of the arguments mean that why why it's 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 the lamppost effect, of course. It's because where we have the best observational data, but that's not really true any longer because with gravitational lensing, we can actually measure the masses around galaxies on scales much larger than the stellar part, and in particular, we can measure we can measure the average mass around galaxies where most of the dark matter is supposed to be. So that we're talking about amounts which are ten times more than what's seen in the inner regions and the bulk of the dark matter. And here we have very definite predictions. For example, if you take all galaxies of the mass of the Milky Way or a tenth of the mass of the Milky Way and, or 10 times the mass of the Milky Way and you measure the amount of mass around them, we can do that with gravitational lensing and measure it as a function of distance on average very accurately. And we can also predict it from our standard model accurately and we get a prediction which is... Uh, an excellent agreement and this seems to me is just has you know this is not really addressed by Mon because on scales well outside of this and, and Mon no longer predicts in this regime the flat rotation curve well, I mean if you if you take it naively it would be a flat rotation curve in practice this is a scale where Mon is not designed for and you have to solve a more complicated theory which depends on how we extend MON to go beyond just the inner regions of galaxies. What I'm saying is we're focusing all, all the effort on the inner regions, which is a small fraction of the dark matter, if there is dark matter, and where the processes due to the formation of the stars and the other things are most complicated, and neglecting most of the dark matter, which is seen either in the microwave background, where it's seen you know, filling the universe effectively, or... Um, in, in between galaxies at lower redshifts or around galaxies at redshifts, we're, there we're seeing the bulk of this material and it all fits together in the same, same structure, the same paradigm, the same prediction from the initial conditions which we've been given in the early universe. And it seems to me this outweighs, I mean, I don't disagree with anything that Stacey's saying, basically. I'm just, it's a matter of, of judgment that for me, that this, all this information about the bulk of the dark matter distribution on different scales at different epochs outweighs the fact that there are still some aspects we can't quite understand in the middle of galaxies where the things are the most complicated. Stacy, do you want to reply to that? Well, so so first, I, I, so I think you found some points of genuine disagreement, but there's oh, still really? a lot of agreement. So, <laughs> so to start there, I think it is a matter of how you weigh the various lines of evidence. And that's sort of what I meant by incommensurate. So certainly if I put on a cosmologist hat, cosmologist's hat, then I look at all the large scale structure results, the microwave background, and I say, yeah, this works so well, that, that has to be right. Um, if I put on a, a, a Mond hat, I'd say, well, how do you explain this? And I, I don't want to let Simon off too easy about uh, <laughs> dismissing the inner parts of galaxies because the observed behavior is simple. There are lots and lots of things that you might have happen in a dark matter model with, once, especially once you consider feedback and, and all these other effects that 
can and, and should happen at some level. Um, but sort of the last thing you would expect to emerge from that is MOND. And that's what the data clearly look like on, on those scales. Let, let me come back then perhaps on, on the very small scale, because it's less clear what happens if you go to the very smallest scales, right? Because okay. the smallest scale, which I think is another interesting way we can go, because after all, the very smallest, people call them galaxies. I'm not sure galaxy is really the right name. The very smallest galaxies we know about are the ultra faint dwarf satellites, the Milky Way. So the extreme case is a galaxy called Segway 1, which has a, a, a few hundred solar masses of stars spread out over a fraction of a kiloparsec, a few, I think it's a few tens of parsecs in size, but with velocities of, 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 of a few kilometers a second. So if you go through this Ficky type calculation to estimate the mass there, you know, there are only 100 solar masses in stars, but you need roughly 100 times that to explain the size of the velocities. So this doesn't work in MOND well because it's very close into the Milky Way. It's outside the regime where MOND normally works. So this is another another regime where where it's it's difficult. So the, the galaxies that uh, Stacey's been talking about so far, we've been concentrating on a somewhat larger. They they have a million solar masses in stars, or typically something of this order, maybe a bit more. So if you go down, there are much smaller things than this where they still appear to need substantial amounts of dark matter. And so the MOND also would need to solve this small scale problem. So I'm interested how Stacy thinks these objects would fit in. Stacy, So I, I, I want to come back to gravitational lensing, but to uh, address that specific question, let's, let's quantify the range over which I, I think it works. And that's from basically the ultra faint scale, about 10 to the fifth solar masses of stars uh, up to 10 to the 12-ish solar masses and stars. Uh, MON seems to work very well. When you get bigger than that, you get into the cluster and groups range, and it gets very confusing because um, there are some groups in that range uh, where it seems fine with MON. Once you get up to the richest clusters, it's not. Um, that is a real and long-term persistent problem for MON that um, putting on a MON hat, you would say it has a missing baryon problem. There should be more stuff than you see. Um, the same kind of thing, as, as Simon described, seems to happen for the ultra faints. Uh, and I looked into this in some detail a, a little over a decade ago. And uh, the, the problem with the ultra faints, as Simon said, is that they are all very close to the Milky Way. And so they're subject to, well, in MON, there's something called the external field effect. Uh, but even worse than that, they're subject to tidal disruption. And when you try to build models of these things, either conventionally with dark matter or in MON, you basically end up throwing your hands and saying, there's no way this thing is in equilibrium. Um, and then, you know, basically the, the basic assumption that you made in order to calculate the mass goes out the window because that velocity dispersion that you measure isn't necessarily telling you what the total mass is in either theory. I want to expand on that a little bit because, you know, we have done a lot of work on those kinds of galaxies. And while well, for the, the tiniest ultra faints, I don't think MOND works right now, but it's also not clear to me that it should because it's not clear to me that those things are in equilibrium or that they even deserve to be called galaxies. Um, but yeah. if you look at slightly bigger things, um, the, the, the so-called dwarf spheroidals, the classical dwarfs, um, there are a couple of those that are problematic, but a lot of them um, are not. They agree pretty well with MOND. And in fact, uh, it is God, it is a decade ago now. Um, this is one time I, I collaborated with Milgram actively, because at that time there was this survey going on called PANDAS in which they were turning up all sorts of new dorsoidals uh, around Andromeda. And so I realized there was an opportunity to test uh, the theory because they were saying, hey, here's this object, and they tell me the luminosity and its size, and I could use the theory to predict then how fa fast the stars would be moving, and the observers were off um, um, measuring those things. And so we were actually able to predict the, the velocity dispersions that would be measured for all these uh, dwarfs as they were being discovered, and we managed to predict a lot of those things a priori. 
And basically there are 30 some of those things now, known now, and there's one that's problematic. The, all, the rest all basically came true. And so this is the thing that they keeps fit, my they fit attention. Mon, the Mond paradigm is what you're saying. In Mond, that's right. right. And I tried right. to do it for dark matter too, but as Simon will appreciate, it's, it's hard to do it for dark matter because of all the complications that he mentioned. You, you don't really have a clear way to go from, okay, I expect this distribution of dark matter halos, but what's the galaxy living inside each one? And what am I going to observe for the individual stars? In Mond, you don't have that. It's just what you see. And so either the theory works or it doesn't. And you can use Mond to predict observable consequences in advance for real galaxies in the universe. And it's been demonstrated to work over and over and over again. Crater 2 only had a velocity dispersion of a few kilometers a second. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was the prediction, again, a priori, whereas you would have thought if it's living in a, a sort of quasi-normal NFW halo extending out to a, a kiloparsec as it does, you ought to have seen 15, 20 kilometers a second. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I, I, I'm happy to consider models of dark matter, whatever, that explain these data. But what keeps my attention on MOND is that I can make this prediction in MOND, and more often than not, it comes true. And I cannot make that same prediction with dark matter in spite of many efforts to do so, because uh, I don't know how to go from the dark matter, which is predictable, uh, to what I see. And that's, that's really the crux of it for me, is the, the ability to make those real universe predictions. Simon, do you want to come back on that? Well, I think, uh, take the dwarfs for idols, I think you, you, you can go from what you predict, uh, seed to what we'll predict from the theory um, in the sense that the, the theory predicts a set of possible small dark matter objects it's called dark matter subhalos which should exist orbiting around the milky way <clears throat> which are essentially in, in the regions that are relevant for the dwarf spheroid or one parameter family so you should be able to find uh, if you imagine the stars that you see sitting in equilibrium inside one of these things, you should be able to find one, you know, as a function of this one parameter which fits the velocities you see. And that turns out you can do that. You can fit all the velocity data uh, taking one potential well from this family to fit uh, essentially all, all the known, all at least all the classical dwarf spheroidals. Credit to, I think you're right, is a, is a, is a, is a case which is an outlier and it's hard to understand. But leaving that one aside, the other, <clears throat> the other dwarf galaxies, you can fit inside a potential well of this kind. And then you can ask, well, and for each one, you know the value of this parameter, which is actually turns out to effectively be the mass of the object. So you can ask, is the distribution of dark matter masses that you find for the objects plausible? And other reasons are is it somewhere so very very strange value very large or very small compared to what you would have naively expected and it comes out to be in in a reasonable range so i don't while, while you can't predict it in the sense you can say a priori exactly where the stars should form in the dark matter potential well if you assume the stars formation hasn't affected the dark matter potential well <clears throat> much then the theory does provide the potential wells which could host the observed distributions of stars, with possibly one or two exceptions. Well, me, which, is, which is weak, which is, I agree, I mean, there's clear this is weaker in the sense that you, you show it, you show it, you can't exclude it. It doesn't show, it's not a no, a no parameter prediction of the kind that you were, you were putting forward. And is, is Mond a no parameter prediction, Stacey? <laughs> it, well, in some cases. Right. And so basically you do have, it has this acceleration scale. So this, this <laughs> bit, I guess we skipped that I should explain that, mm -hmm. you know, when we think about modifying the law of gravity in this context, um, our brains are obsessed by size. So, right. The first thing that we think of as well, Newton works great in the solar system. Galaxies are much bigger. So maybe there's some length scale uh, where that force law changes. Uh, and people tried this, and, and that fails horribly. That does not work. 
Um, but Mond, uh, well, what Milgram said is, well, there could be other scales. And the one he settled on as, as having a chance was an acceleration scale. And so it's uh, a modification that happens at very low accelerations, um, about one angstrom per second per second. It's a crazy small number, but that's typical of the centripetal accelerations that stars and galaxies experience. And these really low mass and low surface brightness galaxies that we're talking about are, are even lower than that, a tenth uh, of uh, an angstrom per second per second. And that's where the modification really kicks in. And so that's where you have to really, really <laughs> to, to test it. Um, so, you know, I, I think Simon and I could go back and forth about the dwarf sphroidals all day. <laughs> We're um, not going to so do that. I, yeah, I think uh, I would like to come back to the point about gravitational lensing. because. Uh, well, important... Just before you do that, though, while we're talking about the acceleration scale, there is an important corollary of that, which you already touched on, which is that if they're <clears throat> going to have a new theory with a new constant, it's important that the value of the constant should be the same for all the systems that you're talking about, at yep. least if you think it's a constant of nature. And that's the issue which which seems to go wrong for the richest galaxy clusters. Yes. In other words, the, the value of the acceleration constant, which you need for MOND to work in the dwarf galaxies, doesn't seem to work. If you use the same value for galaxy clusters, you'd need a different value. And if it's really a new law of nature, you don't want to change the value for different objects. I absolutely agree with that. And, and the... The thing that amazes me about this is that in galaxies over that sort of six order of magnitude range in mass that I mentioned, it does seem to be a constant. Mm -hmm. um, and people argue about that. And I, in fact, I refereed a paper not too long ago that said, oh, oh, this galaxy, it's, it's the number is 1.8 instead of 1.2. Like, <laughs> that is well within the uncertainties of, of what we don't know, because there is a physical uh, parameter that you can't get away from, and that is the mass to light ratio of the star. Right. So that is something you don't know perfectly a priori, and you need the mass to make the prediction um, when what you measure is the light. So that's not really a parameter of MON, but it's a parameter that comes up in either theory and you can't get away from just how much are the stars doing. And so I want to draw, uh, and this is a really important uh, point that Simon raises. So if you just use a naught as a fit parameter and let it differ from galaxies to galaxies, then yeah, you find that it varies. If you say, okay, but I think maybe this is a physical constant, let's fix it. Is the distribution of stellar mass to light ratios that I require to then vary that parameter in order to fit things, is that reasonable compared to what we know about stellar populations? And the answer is an emphatic yes, uh, you reproduce uh, the expected normalization about what is the mass to light ratio. It should be about that of the sun because the sun's fairly typical. It could have been 10 or 100 uh, or 0.2 in this strange theory, right? But it comes out pretty reasonably. Always a welcome guest. You know, every yeah, every yeah, show yeah. should have a cat. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, so the normalization is right. Um, the stellar population models tend to predict a, a, a correlation between the mass to light ratio of the stars and their color, older populations being redder and having higher mass to light ratios. You recover that from what Mond wants. And you also recover a reasonable amount of scatter. That is the variation that people sometimes claim is in the acceleration constant. That's, that's exactly the amount of scatter that you expect uh, in, in for just for the mass to light ratio of stars, just from completely independent stellar population considerations. And so as somebody who's worked on stellar populations and galaxies, that's that's really impressive to me. And I, I don't know uh, how else you would get to that. However, that, um, as we've been discussing, that stops somewhere around the 12th solar mass. As you look at bigger galaxies, the, most, the richest clusters of about 10 to the 14 solar masses in baryons, 10 to the 15 in uh, total dynamical mass, if you count the dark matter. And there, if you apply the same um, MON formula with the same acceleration constant, then you fall short, right? And that, that's about a factor of two, but it's, it seems to be a real factor of two, right? So if, if you back way up and from, you know, an astronomer, 
the, the astronomical scales perspective, then you say, well, all the mass discrepancy always appears at that acceleration scale. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Uh, it could have been orders of magnitude, right? The solar system could have tons of dark matter in it, uh, or some galaxies could have none. Some galaxies claim to have none. But almost always, it the, the mass discrepancy appears at this acceleration scale. The one exception is rich clusters of galaxies, and it's almost that scale, and it's a factor of two different. And sometimes that factor of two matters, and sometimes it's far from the course. Um, I think it matters, um, but I'm not willing to just say, okay, I can ignore everything else that Mon does so well uh, because of this one problem. Maybe okay, let me, let, me, let me move the conversation on a little bit. I just want to highlight some issues <coughs> that have been raised in, in relation to this. So, so a few other things, like there's the missing satellite problem. Um, can you tell us what is, anyone can come in here, what is the missing satellite problem and, and how does this fit into our, our discussion? Uh, the missing satellite problem, well, is, a, is if you take simulations of the dark matter distribution in the cold dark matter universe, you predict and just run them forwards and ask what dark matter structures do you find, <clears throat> you predict dark matter structures not only on the scale of, of the Milky Way's dark matter distribution, or the dwarf, dark matter distribution associated with dwarf galaxies, but also dark matter distributions on much smaller scales, <clears throat> down perhaps to the mass of the Earth. I mean, really much smaller scales. So, <clears throat> so that means that if, if, if we could see the dark matter, <clears throat> according to this theory, you'd see hordes and hordes of very small lumps of dark matter everywhere, including in the, in the, in the halo of the Milky Way. Now, the missing satellites problem was that at the time it was pointed out, there are a relatively small number of satellites known in the halo of the Milky Way. Satellites meaning small, small galaxies, 10 or so, 10 or 15, I don't remember the exact number. And this was thought to be a problem. Nowadays, because of new surveys, there are probably more than 100 known. But no, I, I don't really see that's less of a problem. The issue, the issue is... You're predicting lots and lots of dark matter structures, but you have to understand which ones have stars and which ones don't. And that's never been clear. That's related to the problem we were discussing earlier about the inner parts of galaxies. It depends on what the circumstances are where, 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 um, where stars form. And depending on your understanding of star formation, there's, it's, it's clear, you know, an Earth, an Earth, an Earth mass dark matter clump can't form a sun inside it, right? That's fairly obvious. So there has, to, there has to be a lower limit to the mass of a dark matter clump which can make any stars, and the issue is where that limit comes. So it could have occurred at the place where there are only 10 satellites. It could occur at a place where there are 100 satellites. It could occur at a place where there are 1,000 satellites. It just depends on how the physics of star formation works at the lower limit where you just barely manage to make one star. And we're still a long way from understanding that in any detail. So I think this was always a fictitious problem, right? That because we don't understand the lower limit to star formation well enough to decide whether there is, in fact, a problem or not. Stacey, is it a fictitious problem? Well, I, I don't think it impacts the, the main point of our discussion too much. I mean, one of the right. good things about the cold dark matter paradigm is that it does predict the mass function of halos. That is, how, what is the number of, of halos as a function of mass? And as Simon just described, there should be lots and lots of little halos for every big halo. And so if you start with the assumption, the obvious assumption that there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the mass of the halos and the mass of stars inside them, then there's a problem. Because making that assumption, you predict there should be as many dwarf satellites as there are little dark matter halos, and we don't see that many. Um, but, but as Simon said, that's actually not, we, we've sort of obsessed with that assumption, and we tried all through the 1990s to not have to break it, but it's clearly broken, and it's not, I don't think it's unreasonable that it's broken. Um, one can get into more higher level concerns like the too big to fail problem, which is sort of a subset of that because there are some, right, there's sort of a gap 
between the the bigger galaxies and the local group and the smaller ones. And so it's easy to imagine there's a threshold, as Simon described, where you just stop being able to make stars. But there seem to be some intermediate masses where you should have made stars still if you made them in still smaller objects, but didn't. But, you know, I don't, if I put on a Mont hat, I don't even have a prediction for the mass function, so I, I can't complain. <laughs> right? I, mean, I, I think it actually, we don't have that much longer. I think it'd be more productive to go back to the gravitational lens. Yeah, I issue. agree. So, so why, why, Stacey, so why didn't you tell us what you think about that? Well, so I, I want to be sure we're on the same page about what we're talking about, because we can argue about the interpretation, but we also first have to agree on the facts. And mm -hmm. so one of the, you know, people doing been doing gravitational lensing work for a long time. And for a while, it was um, inferred that there was an edge to dark matter halos of two or 300 kiloparsecs, which seemed reasonable. Uh, in terms of dark matter halo, and not even unreasonable in terms of MON, because in MON, you have to worry about the mass distribution of everything else in the universe. Um, easy way to think about this is between the Milky Way and Andromeda, um, there's some mass weighted midpoint, and at one point, you're more attracted to Andromeda than the Milky Way. So if you do this exercise there, you're, you're not going to see beyond that edge. Um, but then there's a, the more recent work by uh, Brower et al. Uh, this is in 21. And then my postdoc, Tobias Mistela, just um, published a paper reanalyzing those data because he worked out a, a really clever way of, of uh, estimating the errors that, that reduces the, the noise a bit. Um, and, but the th key thing that Brower et al. did was is uh, identify isolated galaxies. So you could look at the lensing signal from individual galaxies that didn't have a lot of satellites, at least not bright ones, uh, around them, out to sort of megaparsec scales. Um, and there, uh, the empirical result is basically that the effective gravitational potential around those isolated galaxies is consistent with what would cause you a flat rotation curve out to where the data fade out. Right, and, and Simon will immediately recognize that that means the density profile of the dark matter halo needs to fall off as R to the minus two, that's the 3D mass density. Whereas his simulations predict that it should fall off as R to the minus three. And what- Here I think we actually have a data d d disagreement. Okay, so, so we have to agree on reality first before we talk about interpretation. Yes, so here are the, so what I'm talking about is taking isolated galaxies in, in the nearby universe, so from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, let's say, to be specific. Find ones which isolate in the sense they don't have any comparably large galaxy within a megaparsec or two. And then stacking the weak lensing signal around samples of those galaxies as a function of their stellar mass. And this was done by Rachel Mandelbaum. And and it gives you, as a function of the mass of the galaxy in the middle, in stars, the weak lensing signal as a function of projected distance. And the measurements go from about uh, 30 kiloparsecs out to uh, 10 megaparsecs. And there's just a signal which you can get for galaxies from about the Milky Way mass and higher, up to rich cluster galaxy, central galaxy masses. And that's measured with small error bars over the whole range. And now what you can do is you can ask what is predicted in a cold dark matter universe. So you can take a simulated universe, populate the halos with galaxies in order to get the galaxy mass function right, and then make a mock catalog, pick isolated galaxies in the same way, stack them in the same way, and compare the signals. And what you, what you find is, 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 is essentially a perfect agreement all the way from 30 kiloparsecs to, to 20 or so megaparsecs all the way from uh, to central galaxy masses of a few uh, a fraction of 10 to the 11 up to 10 to the 12 and a half with within the error bars with and that's with no uh, that's a no parameter prediction in this case because the cosmological theory was given somewhere else and the, the, the observations of the lensing weren't used in fitting so that sounds to me like very similar to what you just described but with a different answer. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I'm not yeah. quite sure. We we need to compare and uh, yeah. and see why why they're different. Yeah, we, we, we definitely have to agree on reality well, first. Yeah. Well, one sec, guys. I just want to summarize this this lensing issue that we're talking about because we're used to the idea that dark matter is inferred from from gravitational lensing, uh, but in yes. this case, you're talking about stacking images. What 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 is different here from the regular issue of well, we see there must be more mass from from gravitational lensing. Well, no, this is using the gravitational lensing. So what we're stacking is the gravitational lensing signal. The point is, if you just take one individual galaxy, there aren't enough background galaxies to get a very precise signal for the mass distribution. Right. <clears throat> so to get to, so although you can't get a very accurate result for any single galaxy, if you average together lots of galaxies of the same mass, then it gets much more precise. So the stacking is basically just the averaging together of lots of similar galaxies in order to get a more precise answer. So this is in principle, is you know what astro images do and what you do on your phone. You're stacking lots of. Yeah, the stacking here is actually in the in the computer. Yes, you're yeah. you're looking at the background images around each of them, measuring <clears throat> a mass profile for each one, and then averaging those mass profiles. And then it comes out in favour of. Dark <laughs> then it comes out a great, uh, with essentially perfect agreement with what you get by taking a simulated cold dark matter universe and making a mock. A set of galaxies and doing the same operations and seeing what's predicted. So Stacey, that, how do you yeah, that, that's that? exactly where I think we need to go back and, and look at. All right. So unfortunately, we didn't. We needed this conversation before before yeah. before this interview because we need to compare our answers and see if they appear to be different. Why they're different? Yeah. So so the 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 result I was referring to uses the kids survey um, and gamma to a lesser extent, but exactly the same exercise. You stack isolated galaxies. Uh, you go from about 30 kiloparsecs out to several megaparsec scales. That should be the same range, yeah. Uh, and so in that exercise, which like I say... Uh, but how did, how did you get the cold dark matter predicted profiles? Because uh, may I be slightly technical, because when you do this, you, you get two regimes very close to the central object, you're completely dominated by the halo of the galaxy you're looking at. And then when you get far away from the, from the galaxy, you're dominated by the halo, it's not of the galaxy itself, but its friends who happen to be nearby. So that's called the one halo term for when it's your own halo and, and the two halo term when it's the halos of your friends that you're picking up. And so you need a detailed simulation in order to treat the transition between just, these just two to regimes explain correctly. To, to the audience that when you say halo, we're talking about this idea that dark matter surrounds a galaxy in a sort of spherical halo. Is that right? Correct. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so there's there's the dark matter halo. Then it also has its sub halos. It has nearby halos. And so then that's the two halo term. That the two halo term is, is 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 the halo surrounding other galaxies nearby. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so yeah. So you want to get the prediction right. Uh, that includes all that. So the construction yeah. of the, um, so I was just talking about the data side and by construction, it's trying to minimize that. And we've gone in and played with the selection criterion and you can see, you know, if you don't select isolated galaxies, you can see what you would describe as the two halo term kick in. So we think we've picked pretty isolated galaxies. Um, you still get a two halo term. I mean, uh, that's uh, yes. Yeah. And so what? Uh, so I've done this analytically. Sorry, we, we shouldn't get into such a, a technical. Yeah, so we're getting a little bit into the, the minutia here. Um, so, so let, let me just say that the Brouwer all did um, refer to simulations. I think Bahamas was one of them, and Mice was one of them, um, and they do show NFW like turndowns from the data at very low accelerations. Um, and so, you know, they did exactly the, the exercise that you want of going into the simulation and, and looking out and doing this, and they still find something lower than what, okay. the, in their case, what they fought, found for the lensing signal. So that, that's an important factual thing that we have to uh, get right before we can interpret it. I, I want to I want to move things on a little bit. Um, there are a couple of like big, more big picture issues that, that have been raised in the popular media. One in particular is the bullet cluster. And I've heard headlines, I've seen headlines say absolutely knockout punch for dark matter and a problem for dark matter. So can you explain what is this bullet cluster? And is this 
you know, evidence for or against dark matter. Uh, yes. Stacey, why don't, why don't you give it a second? Well, so first of all, what it is, uh, it's, it's a pair of merging galaxy clusters. Um, so you don't just see a whole lot of galaxies, you see two clumps of galaxies uh, and associated X-ray emitting hot gas. Most of the normal mass that we know about in clusters of galaxies is in that intracluster medium, the hot gas between the galaxies. And in the case of the bullet cluster, you've had these uh, a larger cluster and a smaller cluster come together, pass through each other, and you can see the resulting shock wave in the uh, uh, gas of, of the, the bullet component of the cluster, hence the name. Uh, and you can also do the gravitational lensing exercise and you get a lot of mass. And what you see there is that there's uh, the usual amount of mass for a cluster of galaxies, which in the standard picture is it's, you know, basically the same ratio as you get for the whole universe of about five parts dark matter to one part normal matter. Um, and that all seems to be in order. And what's really dramatic um, and the argument against Mond is that the mass indicated by lensing is um, concentrated on where the galaxies are rather than where the gas is. And so if most of the normal matter is in the gas and it's a modified gravity theory, then you would think the lensing signal would know about the gas and not about the galaxies. Okay, so that's a really powerful argument against Mont. Um, it, it's kind of strange, and it depends on your personal route to this. So if that's the first thing you ever heard, it's like, okay, case closed. Um, now, as we've mentioned several times already, clusters are a known problem um, in this respect. And I, I would say there's, they have a missing baryon problem. It doesn't have to be non-baryonic dark matter of the sort the particle physicists event. It just has to be unseen stuff. Uh, and I don't like that, but it's a logical possibility. And we already know that's true of clusters in general. And what the bullet cluster shows is exactly that discrepancy. So it would have been really weird, even from a Mon perspective, if they hadn't, <laughs> if it hadn't shown that. Um, what is new there is that that whatever that unseen mass is, be it black holes or brown dwarfs or genuine non-baryonic cold dark matter, whatever, it's collisionless. The gas collided with itself shocked and the collisionist stuff, the small particles like the galaxies went on through. And so whatever that extra mass is went with the galaxies. So that is extra information that, that constrains the kind of models you could hope to build, none of which I find satisfactory in Mond, but you, know, you can at least attempt to do it. Um, the other thing that, that uh, is important and Simon's worked on and I've worked on is what that collision speed was. You can estimate uh, from the shock what, what speed the things had to hit at in order to give you that shock wave. And it's shockingly large. Um, and if you do the naive calculation to say, OK, you have these two clusters in an expanding universe, let them fall back together, it doesn't go fast enough. Um, and so this has been written about a lot in the literature, and, and I guess I would say you can get away with it in the conventional sense, but it's hard. Um, that's basically the same thing I was saying for Mond, is it's missing mass problem. You can get away with it by making up stuff you don't see, but it's, it's not satisfactory. Um, on the other hand, this high collision speed is very natural in Mond. It's a long-range force law. That's what it does. And so how do you weigh these two different pieces of evidence from the same object? You know, if you want to put all your money on the collision speed, then you actually say it's dark matter that has a problem, not mod. And vice versa, of course, where they're like, look, there's a clump of mass that's doing lensing that you cannot see. That's dark matter. Um, the thing we have to be careful about there is making the leap from there being unseen mass that's doing that lensing to being the non baryonic cold dark matter like WIMPs or something like that. Because um, there are a lot of unseen baryons we haven't identified, right? We know what the baryon density needs to be from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. If you add that up, you know, it, the, the checksum isn't quite complete. So maybe we need some baryons there. Uh, like I say, I don't find any of those satisfactory. And I, 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 I'm very pessimistic at this point for both theories. And this is one of the reasons that clusters don't make sure any sense in either case. One thing we established at the beginning, it must be one of the two theories, right? There must no, be I don't think that's true. Or modified gravity is not 
Well, we, maybe we will come on to a third option a, a little, a, in a little bit. But Simon, I mean, can you just address this issue of the, the velocity? So, you know, this lens. Well, first, issue... first of all, there are, there are published simulations which do reproduce the velocities. So, so you can argue, you know, how likely this is and, you know, whether they had to be really lucky. But it's not totally impossible in the standard model. And I think the other thing is that the bullet clusters now, I guess more than 10 years old. I don't remember when the first paper came out, almost 15 years ago, I think. So now there are other clusters which are even better. And in fact, uh, I don't know if Stacy's seen this, but there's truly beautiful uh, lensing results for a cluster called Abel 2744, which some people call the Pandora cluster, mm -hmm. which is it's based on JWST data, which is truly spectacular because by combining strong lensing and weak lensing data on the on on this cluster from JWST they were able to make a mass map for this for the cluster which is much higher resolution and much more detailed than any previous cluster that I've seen and it, what's extraordinary about it is it's a very complicated cluster with several different lumps so it's no not a regular thing at all it has at least five different major lumps and the the mass is a uh, from the lensing is very closely concentrated around the galaxies, including all the different lumps and the detailed things. So it's, there's a very close correspondence between the mass map, which was made without any reference to the actual galaxies in the cluster and the position of the actual galaxies in the cluster. Whereas the X-ray image is completely different. The gas, extra gas is all over the place and not concentrated in the same places at all. So I, I don't know about the relative velocities in this case of the different pieces, but it is clear that there's a very detailed mass map where the mass corresponds to the light and the gas, which is, you know, the, the gas mass is still pretty much higher than the mass in stars that we see, uh, is different. So this particular kind of uh, problem is now seen in, in many clusters. And this is just a very recent, beautiful example of it. Right. Yeah, and so, it's striking Stacey, to me. Stacey, very quick response, yeah. and then I want to move on to another topic. Okay, sure. No, I mean, that's right. And I, I think these things are very confusing. Um, I mean, the fact that the lensing mass tracks the light so well it kind of makes you say, it's okay, maybe it's just the gravity of the stars, which makes no sense in a physical theory, right? But it's not obvious that that makes sense in the dark matter theory either. And there are lots of these clusters now. Um, the prediction was that in MOND, you would have higher collision velocities more frequently um, whether there are enough statistics to work that out now i don't I know i think there are predictions for the dark matter theories that i, that I disagree oh. with you no no i'm not I'm saying not dark matter clusters, matter. But for clusters like this one okay well that, I, I don't know that could well be um it's it's a mess is what i'm saying um, yeah, the cluster is a mess that's right yeah that, okay, that, so that, that we can agree <laughs> on that. All right, let's move on to the cosmic microwave background because one argument I've heard a lot is that dark uh, modified gravity may work in galaxies, but it really does not do well for the cosmic microwave background. So uh, I did, Simon, can you explain what is the problem for modified gravity in the, in the cosmic microwave background? Well, and, um, I think to be fair to modified gravity, it wasn't designed for this. So it wasn't intended to be applied in this regime. So the question is, can, can the theory as Milgram originally set it up be embedded in a more general theory, which is closer to the standard general relativity that people usually use for cosmology in such a way as to address the, the fluctuations in the microwave background. So when we look at the microwave background, we're looking at a universe which is very nearly uniform, and there are only small fluctuations in density from place to place, which you can think of as like sound waves traveling through the universe at early times. And that's what we're actually seeing. So you need a theory which can treat the evolution of sound waves in, in the early universe. And what the observations are telling us is there is a component at that time which acts like it gravitates. It uh, has no strong pressure component and it has no interaction with the baryons or the light, but nevertheless is, is fluctuating. So that's what the observation so The question is, can a Mon theory extended this regime have a similar component? And I think the answer is maybe. I mean, there are some examples which at least come close. I mean, to me, I would look at these and say, well, they've added it by making a more complicated theory of gravity, which has extra fields in it. And the extra fields have a behavior which is very like that of cold dark matter. Okay. So, you know, maybe is it different from the cold dark matter theory or not? 
this is probably is a, you know, it's a question of point of view almost. So that's my take on it, but I'd be interested to hear what Stacy thinks. Stacy? So I largely agree. Um, this is a, a long history with me because, you know, I've, I've emphasized the predictive power of Mon for individual objects that, that in the real world I can go and do this exercise. Uh, in cosmology, there's also a series of successful things when, you know, we, you know, Simon will remember the standard cold dark matter when we were convinced the mass density had to be the critical density and, and he and many others showed that that couldn't be the case. And we've ended up with Lambda CDM with this dark energy component filling in the difference. Um, and it took many, many, many steps to get there, but by the mid nineties that had emerged as, as something that needed to happen. And then that Can predicted... I just clarify, Stacey, with critical density, you're basically saying that the universe appears roughly flat and yes. in order to get it flat, we need to invoke extra stuff. Yes. And the dark matter was thought to be the extra stuff. And then it, you guys worked out it's not enough. There has to be something else. And that yeah. something else is the dark energy that was discovered in 1998, right? Exactly. And, it, and, and that's why I want to say this. It wasn't really discovered in 1998. We knew it had to be there if it was going to work out by the mid-90s. And the prediction was that if that was really true, that we had to have this cosmological constant again, then the, the expansion rate would be accelerating. And at the time, that sounded kind of bat guano insane. Um, and so then it was amazing when the supernova experiments found exactly that. And so that's, that's sort of, I'm trying to be generous to the standard picture here, because I think that was a prediction that was, that came true. Um, and even then with the supernova data, um, really what it excluded was sort of a normal FRW cosmology without the lambda, but it didn't really tell you the universe was flat and we were kind of leaning hard at the time around the turn of the century on it, it being flat. And so when the first really good microwave background data came back and showed that the first peak fell in exactly the location that you would expect for a geometrically flat universe, it was like, oh goodness, because you know we could have lived in something even more complicated. I don't the CDM is hard enough, but, um, but that was another successful prediction. And then that goes on and predicts, okay, there should be a scale in the baryon acoustic oscillations, which you might've heard of, and that also comes true. So both theories have this series of successful predictions in very different regimes. And so now the, the microwave background, um, you know, as Simon says, you need a theory that addresses that. Mon by itself is an extension of Newtonian dynamics. It, it doesn't do any of the relativity that you need to do this calculation. Didn't um, Beckenstein so create a relativistic version? He did. And, um, and it didn't work in this way. So Beckenstein tried for many years to do this. And in fact, an argument made to me many times against Mond was that, well, if Beckenstein tried to do this and he couldn't, and if he couldn't do it, then it can't be done. Um, and then in 2004, I think it was, he came up with Tevis, uh, T-E-V-E-S, which is for tensor vector scalar, because if you're gonna have a tensor component, you can also have a vector component and a scalar component. Um, and the success of Tevis was to explain gravitational lensing. Uh, that was what his previous theories had failed to do. You could, you could get an, a boost to the kinematics, but you wouldn't get a boost to the lensing. So Tevis succeeded in explaining lensing, but it did not really work um, for the microwave background. Um, and so, and, and it has other failings, uh, the, so it's gone by the wayside. But, you know, you don't just come up with a new extension of general relativity overnight, and people have been working on this. And so, you know, I, I think as we said early on, you have to explain all the data everywhere. And the, the question to me is whether uh, for the galaxy things, we can really come up with a satisfactory dark matter explanation. And a lot of people, not Simon, but a lot of people in the field just assume that that will inevitably happen because obviously it's correct. And I'm, I'm not <laughs> willing to grant that assumption. Um, but it's also, you know, uh, one could make the same mistake putting on a Mond hat and saying, oh, well, it works so well for, ga for galaxies that inevitably we'll find uh, the right relativistic theory. That, that's all, also not obvious. Um, so there is a, a very recent theory by uh, Skordis and Zaloshnik. Uh, I think they're calling it 
Ather tensor scalar theory, AST, something like that, um, which they've shown does fit the microwave background data. As Simon says, they have to have these extra components, and basically the scalar field ends up playing a role similar to the cold dark matter in fluctuations. And so you have to add something like that, and either you can say that's a great success to have gotten so far, or that's really horrible because you're just adding new freedoms of free parameters, and so you're just fudging things. And both these things might be true. <laughs> let, me, um, let me bring up another theory that's, that's got some publicity re uh, recently from uh, Sabina Hossenfeld has been pushing this one, uh, which is um, dark matter as a, as a superfluid. And the argument, this is from, um, well, the argument, as I understand it, is that you, you basically have dark matter behaving like a superfluid. And this means that in some scales, it behaves like cold dark matter. And at other scales, it behaves like MOND. And that would explain why in some regimes we see evidence of MOND and in some regimes we see evidence of dark matter. And, and we can combine these. Things. The thing it reminds me of was, um, from my history of astronomy, there was a debate, as I understand it, about the value of the Hubble constant. Some people thought it was 50. Some, another camp said it was 100. And I was told, well, somebody just said, well, it's probably 75 then. You know, you've got good arguments both sides. And indeed... We're still debating the value of the Hubble constant, but it is closer to to around seventy five. Um, so, is are we looking for maybe some some compromise here? Is this theory the 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 thing that we should be looking for, or or, or no? It sounds Simon, to me like a theory which is more complicated than either of the other theories. <laughs> so I don't really see why this is a step forwards. Stacey, what yeah, about you? I, I have the same knee jerk prejudiced against hybrid theories. It's sort of, to make another historical analogy, it seems to me like Tycho Brahe's, right. um, well, let's keep the earth at the center, but everything else can go around the sun. Um, but, you know, that's not really fair and you have to engage with the, the theory and test it. Um, so what I would like to see is a really compelling reason to emerge why we get Mond-like behavior in galaxies. Um, and an obvious way to try to do that is to come up with some form of dark matter that automatically does that. And so that's what, what superfluid dark matter is, is trying to do. There's also um, dipolar dark matter by Luc Blanchet. Um, and so while I have this philosophical distaste for these hybrid theories, it, it, it's something to look into. Um, there is another possible route too, which if someone can show that they can make some um, recipes for how stars form and how feedback works in galaxies and apply them consistently in a cold dark matter simulation and show that they come out with the correct phenomenology across the full galaxy population, that wouldn't prove that they was right, but it should, would show at least it's possible to get the right answer in this theory. And this could happen. I don't think it's happened yet. <laughs> So, so it's a work it, in progress and we'll, we'll see. Yeah, um, I mean, so this goes to the, the, the deeper question of how do we know when we're wrong? Um, absolutely. I mean, right. and, and so, you know, as I described earlier, I worked really hard to make the dark matter paradigm work out before I'd even really looked into Mond or, or even had I'd barely heard of it at that point. And so if there was a, a solution that was going to come naturally, um, it would have come by now. And so what Simon says is true, and maybe it's even right, but I, I would really hope for some more compelling reason that, you know, you get a little bit of feedback there and you get a little bit of that over here. And um, that doesn't feel like it can really ever be satisfactory to me. Um, well, I think you have I, to have one recipe which applies everywhere. You yes. can't shoot for individual objects. Yes. And right now, everybody's recipes are different, right? So right. Um, you certainly... Many you just need are... one set of recipes which are applied consistently across all yeah. scales, and that would show at least an existence proof there is a possible yes. solution. I, I agree completely with that. Um, and, and we're not there yet. Um, right. And I guess what I'm objecting to is not Simon's attitude, but the attitude that I do encounter in a lot of um, my younger colleagues who do this kind of work, that it is inevitably going to work out that way. <laughs> That's, that is not at all obvious to me. Um, let, I've tried, let me raise you know. a, a different topic. Um, 
the lack of detection of dark matter particles. We've been looking for these things in underground detectors for decades and nothing seems to have showed up. I mean, now, fair enough, it might show up tomorrow. Um, how long do we wait? Decades? Hundreds of years? I mean, what, what's the situation here? Well, from a particle physics point of view, as I understand it, the particle physics come up with lots of candidates which we will never detect. And just because we'll never detect them doesn't mean that nature didn't actually choose that route. So, you know, my, my attitude all along was, well, there are these things that look like they might be plausible candidates. So let's look for it because we might be lucky. But it was always the question that we might be lucky. It wasn't that we should actually expect to see it. And unfortunately, I don't think anything's changed except that the things that people initially thought most plausible, a lot of them have been at least partially ruled out. Stacey, what do you think? Could, could nature just be cruel and just give us dark matter particles that we can't detect in these underground detectors? Well, sure. Yeah, I mean, nature has not given us any breaks in this argument so far, has it? Um, you know, I mean, Mon, though it works in the ways I've described, it, why? Who ordered this? You know, it's, it's that kind of situation. Um, whereas with particle physics, it's the opposite thing. Everybody is ordering a batch of things all the time, and you got uh, just a crazy number of possibilities to try to sort through. Um, so I think historically, it's important to say that we did have a leading candidate, the WIMP, the weakly interacting massive particle. And there were really good reasons to think that. Um, and the good thing about a WIMP is it does interact weakly like a neutrino does and so it's not just the gravity but there is this extra uh, just, just to interrupt Stacey, when you say interacts weakly we're talking with the weak nuclear force yes. not not the strength of the interaction yes good right. good point so there are the fundamental forces of nature strong nuclear force weak nuclear force electromagnetism gravity it has mass so it participates in gravity it does not participate in electromagnetism which is good that way it's dark it makes a good candidate for dark matter um, but it is hypothesized to interact weakly. And the reason that that was compelling is the, the WIMP miracle, which uh, in a nutshell is that if you imagine these particles in the early universe in thermal equilibrium with each other, eventually they freeze out. That is, the universe expands far enough, fast enough that they stop interacting and you're left over with some relic abundance. And if you ask what the relic abundance of a weakly interacting particle is, it comes out to about right to be the necessary mass density for the dark matter. And that is kind of amazing. So, you know, these forces are all active on very different scales and there's nothing going on on the inner scale scales in between those things. And so why did nature pick out this one scale to give you the right density uh, for your potential dark matter candidate? It's a miracle. Um, and that, that did seem miraculous at the time. And so that was an important reason that motivated many of the dark matter experiments that are still going on. Um, and there are two parameters that you then have to explore. Um, one is the mass of the WIMP. The other is its actual interaction cross-section. So you can say it interacts weakly, but you have to go through all the theory to figure out what that interaction strength is and therefore how often it will interact with your giant bubble chamber made of xenon or, or whatever you've constructed. Um, and so there were early predictions and the mass was thought to be about a hundred times the mass of a proton. It could be over a big range, but shouldn't be less than two GeV. It could be thousands, which is annoying because the signal in these dark matter detectors is maximized when you have an electric elastic collision mediated by the weak nuclear force. Uh, and so the detector is most sensitive to things that have mass equal to the uh, nuclei that it's bouncing off of, be it xenon or argon or whatever. So you want, you would hope it's something around 100 GeV, 100 protons, um, give or take. And that was the early prediction, um, but it was a ballpark thing. The early interaction number was about 10 to the minus 39 per square centimeter, and that was excluded very early on. People build these detectors if it had been that interactive, which is a very small number, but still, you know, particle physicists are really good at this. Uh, and if it had been that interactive, we would have seen it. Uh, and since that time, they keep building bigger and better detectors, and they have pushed the sensitivity down by nearly, you know, 
eight orders of magnitude, something like that. Um, it's an amazing accomplishment. It's like going from, you know, a soccer pitch to something on the moon um, in terms of energy scale. Um, and, you know, we're still aiming for the same goal. Um, and so I would say that uh, the experimentalists have succeeded in failing. That is to say, if the dark matter particle were really the wimp that most of us, including me, uh, had been expecting, we should have seen it by now. Um, and in fact, I will make a sociological prediction is that as these experiments continue to improve, they will hit the neutrino background, right? There should be a astrophysical background from all the neutrinos, from all the supernova that ever went off. We don't know exactly where that is, but they're getting close to it. And so when they finally hit it, they're going to say, ah, that's the dark matter. And then, you know, six months later, they'll say, oh, no, we just hit the neutrino background. Um, because that's how these things have been going. And um, people do make this um, lamp light analogy that we're looking at this because that's where we can see. And that's true. We can build experiments that do this. But all we've done so far is crank up the luminosity of the street light, and we're still not seeing anything there. Um, and so then the question is, okay, well, what else could it be? It could be anything, right? They're very good at coming up with ideas. As Simon says, it could be something that doesn't interact through the weak nuclear force at all. Um, and then we only know about and it. And then we won't see it in any rabbit. experiment of yeah. that type. Yeah. But let me talk about a different experiment, which is the Gaia satellite. So that mm. was launched by European Space Agency. And again, we've seen headlines saying Gaia results spectacularly confirm MOND and spectacularly <laughs> disprove MOND. And uh, so I, we're with you. Know, those of us who are just sort of lay people, bystanders, are a little bit confused, what, and particularly these things called wide binaries. So can you explain, either of you, what are these wide binaries? What, what were the results? And what do they mean for dark matter versus MOND? OK, so I'm reluctant to get into this because I know all the participants about this and this debate has gotten, you know, hot. Uh, and in fact, if if your listeners are interested, I have a series of blog posts on this at Triton Station, so you can go and look those up. Um, but basically, a, a wide binary is a pair of stars that are orbiting each other just at very wide separations. Um, and when you get far enough apart, then you should be in the Mond regime. Right. So the solar system is entirely in the Newtonian regime of high acceleration. You don't get to uh, the sort of acceleration scale of MOND until you get about 7000 AU away from the sun, roughly speaking. That's a long way. Right. Neptune is 40 AU away. So we're, we're nowhere to probing that with solar system data, except maybe for the planet nine thing, which we can come back to if you like. Uh, but so anyway, Gaia has now made it possible to identify candidates of binary stars, some of which are in this uh, regime, where if it's just a straight modification of gravity, then you ought to see the same kind of uh, effect that you see in galaxies. You get into the lower acceleration regimes and the orbits are faster than uh, you would predict with just Newton and the stars mass that you know about. Um, and so in principle, it sounds like a really clean test. Um, in practice, you don't get to watch one binary star orbit over and over. Oh, that's interesting. Um, wow. you, I thought you were yeah. animating the... Uh, the How did you do? Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's this. I don't... Anyway, um, you, you don't get to watch one binary go around. You have to make a statistical argument about the speeds for many, many binary pairs. Um, and so there are these contradictory claims from different groups who have done this exercise, and some claim to see a MOND effect, and others claim to exclude such a MOND effect. And I think, like, the debate about the Hubble constant is going to take a long time to sort that out. What about you, Simon? Have you looked into this sky results? What yes, you... actually, I'm a participant in a long-term observing program in Chile using the, uh, the European Southern Observatory Telescope's to monitor candidate very wide binaries to measure the velocities separately. And it's a very tricky business because you have to measure very small velocities and you have to rule out that the velocities could be due to other things like unknown planets going around either of the stars close enough in to cause a, a velocity or another companion star and various uh, other things. 
So it's it's a very tricky business. So I, I, I agree with uh, Stacy that I think it'll be a long time before it really settles down to to a level where you can be sure one way or the other. Right. So the uncertainties are just too big at the moment. Yeah, it's a very it's a very subtle arrangement. I mean, the, the these stars are so far apart that if a third star comes anywhere near it, it tends to change the orbits completely. And so and so these things are uh, continually being formed and and dissolved again just by random encounters between stars in the disk. Right. Although, I mean, for the Mond issue, there's also the que- the question of the external effect, right? The uh, Mond effect. So that also depends a little on which version of Mond you're talking about, I think. Right. But is the, is the, is the headline, don't believe the headlines? The, yeah, the, the headline is the, the ju- jury's out and it'll be a while before there's any consensus, I think. Right, right. Okay. I mean, is there <coughs> any connection? There are other mysteries in the cosmos where things don't seem to match LCD, you know, Lambda Cold Dark Matter model. In particular, we've got this issue of the Hubble tension, two um, different ways of measuring the expansion of the universe. And they don't seem to match each other, um, and they should. And then we also have this S8 tension, um, where the universe, you know, doesn't seem to match how smooth it should be. Uh, could these be related to dark matter and modified gravity? These sorts of issues, or are they are they just completely separate mysteries that we shouldn't really worry about for this issue? I think the first one is unlikely to be related to dark matter, although they, even that's not excluded. The second one could be. The second one is essentially a problem between the amplitude of fluctuations that you measure by doing dynamical measurements in the nearby universe, uh, uh, sorry, by doing lensing measurements in the nearby universe, and the amplitude of fluctuations that you measure looking at the microwave background. And that's got getting murkier with time, in fact, because it depends which lensing measurements you use in the nearby universe. Most of the publications have been using uh, lensing as measured by very distant galaxies. But actually, you can use the microwave background itself, which is also lensed by everything in front of it, to measure the strength of lensing in the nearby universe. And the recent, most recent measurements using, using that don't find the tension. So now it even looks as though it may depend on exactly which uh, background source to use to measure the lensing strength, whether there's a tension or not. So... Again, there's another case where the jury's out. Um, For the Hubble tension, most of the resolutions that people are suggesting, assuming it's fundamental physics rather than some kind of observational systematic, are not really... They're addressing the aspects of the dark energy, typically, rather than the the dark matter. But... uh, Stacey, do you have... People are creative, so I suspect there are are dark matter versions as well. So, so yeah, I've worried about this a long time, and by coincidence, I, I just resubmitted a paper that touches on some of these issues. Um, you know, one of the things that convinced us all that Lambda CDM was right was the concordance of many independent observational constraints, the shape parameter from large-scale structure, the baryon fraction of clusters, the age of the oldest globular clusters. Uh, and if you do that exercise again today, then you get basically a WMAP3 cosmology, which is to say uh, Hubble constant around what the local values are, 73, um, and a lowish mass density uh, omega matter of a quarter or something like that. Um, And that's different from what the Planck satellite best fit gives you, which is, of course, uh, 67 for the Hubble constant and more like a third for the matter density. And, you know... For us old people, those seems like small beans, the differences, um, but they're they're real. I think the tension is real. Having just gone through this exercise, it's it's getting very hard to reconcile the local measurements um, with something as low as 67. Even the, the lowest one that, that's sort of got small error bars is 69.8 from uh, uh, the Carnegie Chicago survey. Uh, which is lower than the 73 from from Adam Reese and his collaborators, which is a little lower than 75, which is what Tolly is getting, which is what Jim Schaumbert and I got um, from Tolly Fisher. And but even if you go to 69, um, you're not really in agreement with the 67 because also you have to worry about all these other things. And so you're still get, 
getting a lower mass density than what Planck wants um, from all these other constraints that we've got to satisfy. And so, you know, it's, it's a really difficult situation because the tension does look real to me, but is it enough to say, okay, there's nothing left and we've excluded FLRW, right? That there is no standard cosmology and that we have these weird Lambda CDM parameters just because that's the closest we could come to what's actually going on. Um, you know, if I put on a cosmology hat, I say, no, that's silly. It's just, you know, these tensions will get sorted out as we go along. If I put on a mond hat, it's like, well, duh, you know, <laughs> we, we, we've been adding dark matter because really it's a different force law. We keep having to add these things because you're trying to mimic something else going on. Uh, but I don't know what that underlying theory would be or if it's even possible to write, let alone say that it's going to explain all these things. Um, so I, I, having done this for longer than I care to admit, it's, it, I feel like we're up the proverbial creek without a paddle. Right. All right. So let me just do two last topics and then we're going to finish the conversation. Um, firstly, I want to ask about the sociology of science. Um, science, of course, has to be open to new ideas. But on the other hand, it has to be very rigorous and not admit new ideas into the cathedral of knowledge without them being very, very well tested. Um, do you think we're treading the right line at the moment? Has science basically getting it right into its attitude to these ideas or, um, or not? Simon, why don't you start us off with? Well, you talk about science, but I think we should talk about scientists. And it actually depends which scientists you're talking about. So both, both, both Stacey and I can think of colleagues who are on both sides of this, I'm sure. So... I think every, every person has to do, has to think about this seriously and make up their own mind and be willing to justify their point of view. So, for example, something which worries me a great deal is, uh, you, know, Stace, you know, I used to think of Stacey as the young scientist, but now he's already thinking of himself as old. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but what worries me about uh, 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 the attitude of many scientists under 40 say, is that they seem to accept this framework as though it was given and, and to work with inside it. And they also seem to accept uh, computer simulations of complicated processes as though they were reality. And I think this is, is really very dangerous because, you know, gal galaxies are extremely complicated objects with many processes which we know are active and important which act across many scales and couple scales, all the way from you know the vent horizon of the central black hole to the gas distribution a megaparsical way. And all, all these processes are strongly coupled. So they're very complicated objects. And when we try to simulate it, because the processes are coupled, we have to try and simulate all the aspects that are relevant to the things that we want to discuss. And most of these aspects are simulated, you know, if, if you're lucky, if you're charitable, you'd say this is set, they're schematically. Uh, if you're uncharitable, you'd say they're just put in by hand. And so you you have a, an incomplete and an inaccurate simulation of of an incompletely observed system. So how do you decide when you've learned something is is true or not, and how do you actually make any real progress in your knowledge of what you can say is true about how galaxies form? And I think this is actually a very complicated question. It's not one that people think about enough. And so this is very related to exactly what you just said. What about you, Stacey? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, exactly. There's, there's a lot of sociology here. And you can, again, look at the fine grain of individuals and you can find reasonable and unreasonable people in all fields. Uh, I agree with everything Simon just said. Um, and I have noticed... Um, in trying to just talk to some of the younger people who do simulations that they do seem to uh, assume that all the pieces that they inherited are correct and they're just working on the new version. And, you know, if you're like Simon and wrote the original versions, <laughs> then you say what Simon says. Um, but, you know, I have um, noticed a lot of sociological effects as being, you know, I'm here representing the, the, the uh, underrepresented voice, right? Right. 
And uh, I think Simon and I could swap places and, and do an equally good job, but most people could not do that. Um, they're very, it's very tempting to get embedded in the paradigm, the paradigm that we're taught is Lambda CDM. In fact, uh, five years ago, I mentioned to uh, one of my postdocs at the time that, you know, we, we pretty much expected there to be Lambda before the supernova experiments were done. And he's like, what? Uh, I was taught the supernova discovered Lambda. And it's like, well, the history is a little more involved than that, but it's an easy way to teach the subject. So people grow up believing that. Um, in, in the case of the dark matter debate, it, I've noticed it really depends on field. Um, the people, the, the willingness of people to contemplate how, uh, different from the standard cold dark matter picture really uh, correlates with their proximity to cosmology and particle physics, well, anti-correlates, I should say. Um, you know, if you're not deeply invested in there being dark matter, then it's not too hard to think about that being a possibility. If you spent your entire career at the bottom of a mine shaft and you don't want some silly astronomer telling you, yeah, yeah, no, you're looking for the wrong thing. Um, and, and, and I get that. And I have many times had the experience of, of you know, certain people wanting to kill the messenger. So, I'm sorry, you know, if I could <laughs> say, um, you know, Vaughn predicted the wrong thing, I would have said that. And I do say that for things like clusters of galaxies, but it does predict the right things for the experiment that I did. So I don't feel I have the liberty to say it's just wrong or dismiss that that means something. The trick is figuring out what it means. And so the sociology right now is deeply invested in this dark matter paradigm. Um, we've gotten past it having to be wimps um, but it still has to be dark matter for most people. Um, and okay, but then how do you explain these things? And, you know, it could be that what Simon says is correct, that eventually that we'll figure out how to, to do that in simulations. Um, but I think the deeper question is how do we know that we're wrong, right? A, a science should be falsifiable. And if we've excluded WIMPs, okay, well, axions or something else, let's check that. Okay, if we exclude those, then... Uh, we can make up something else and something else and something that we can never hope to detect. And, and it's not really falsifiable, is it? So, uh, you know, that might be right. That might be what the universe is doing. But sociologically, we've already accepted that before uh, we've actually determined it. And, and again, this is why I get very cynical about these things, really, is that we can keep inventing new dark matter particles until the, the cows come home. And... As a group, sociologically, the particle physicists are happy to do that because that's what they do, right? Okay. They don't so let me let me to... let me go to the very last topic as we're, we're running out of time here. Um, let's look to the future. Is there anything on the horizon, new satellite missions, new ground surveys that could help us sort of resolve this issue? Well, uh, so I mean, JWST is already doing work on that. I mean, if they, they've seen a lot of bright galaxies at high redshift. If that's true, there comes a point where that, that breaks our standard structure formation paradigm because they should be boiling up from small things into bigger things, and it takes longer than nominally is seen. I think, you know, the jury is still out on that, but that's something that Simon may remember. Bob Sanders predicted a long time ago that in Bond, you just make those things quite naturally. So that's one thing. Um, in the particle physics regime, what is the mass of a neutrino? Um, the standard um, structure formation paradigm requires the neutrino mass to be small. We know there is some mass because of atmospheric oscillations, but the limits between the minimum from those uh, oscillations and the maximum allowed by structure formation is just a factor of two. It's between 0.06 and 0.12 electron volts. So if it's in that range, yay. Uh, but there are lab experiments, Katrine, uh, for example, that are going to measure this and they're not down to that level yet. And so if they get to that level, yay. Um, but they could measure something crazy like half an EV. Um, that would be really hard to explain with our current dark matter ideas. Um, maybe we could find a way around it, but, but these add to the tensions that we've been talking about. All right, Simon, what are you looking forward to in the, in the future? Well, I, I'm not very optimistic about JWST and high redshift because looking at galaxy formation models, it's it's true that the 
luminosities and the star formation rates and the things they've found so far are higher than were predicted by models. So they're still um, well short of, of the maximum which could be predicted by models within the cold dark matter paradigm. So I, I checked my own models and it would be easily possible to see things in principle up to redshift 25. And we're not we're a long way short of that so far. Um, for the neutrino mass, I think I think what is clear is, as as, as Stacy said, there is this relatively na narrow window where if everything fits together, the neutrinos should have a, a, a sum. The neutrino masses should be in a very narrow range of about a factor of two. That will be measurable from galaxy clustering measurements in the next few years, the next generation of surveys. So either we'll get an astronomical measurement of, of the mass of neutrinos somewhere in this range, and that'll be another consistency check, although the particle physicists probably won't believe the astrophysicists, they'll still have to go measure it for themselves. But more interestingly would be if you've got an upper limit on the sum of the masses in the neutrinos, which is below the lower limit, which they claim so far from particle physics, because that would actually require a major change in, in either particle physics or cosmology. So I think there are possibilities that could come up relatively soon. Great. Well, we'll keep our eyes firmly on it and we'll see, we'll see what happens. Stacy, Simon, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been incredibly uh, useful. I've learned so much and I hope other people will too. So thank you very much, guys. All right. Then. Thank, thank you, Phil. Thanks, Stacy. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's good to see you, Simon. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just stopped the recording.